All right, hey everyone, I'm, I'm John. Uh, I've been working on Istio for over five years now, so really excited to be up here and, and ask, uh, you know, answer any questions and, and whatnot. Louis. Uh, hi, I'm Louis Ryan. Uh, I've been on Istio a little bit longer than John. I won't <laughs> hold that against him. Uh, but yeah, just excited to be here, talk to you all, and uh, hopefully get some inspiration as well. And I'm Mitch Connors. Uh, I'm a software engineer and product manager at Aviatrix, uh, cloud native ambassador. And I, I think I was on Istio for like a month before John joined. So just like squeezed it in there. So yeah, really excited to be here and uh, chat about whatever comes to mind for everyone. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I forgot to introduce. So every panelist has been purposefully selected because they also serve on the Istio uh, Technical Oversight Committee Board. So thank you all for your service. Uh, the other person we're missing is Eric Van Norman. Unfortunately, he couldn't travel to KubeCon. He's like the third or uh, second largest contributor to the Istio project. All right, so I'm going to start with one question, and uh, I would love, love for you all to come up to the mic there, and uh, you know, just if you have any question regarding Istio or the Ambient announcement or any of the, you know, things you want to talk about, any concerns in the Istio community, or even just to show us how much you love Istio, we would love to hear. And I have some T-shirts, so um, I believe I have maybe around. 10 t-shirts are the same t-shirts I'm wearing now. Uh, I love to give away to people who ask the first 10 questions. Uh, if the sizing doesn't work, you can always come to the solo booth to exchange to a different size. But the point is I want you guys to also have the same t-shirt. John just told me it's very high quality. So um, the first question is, um, what are the technical, current technical hurdles around the Istio? So I want one of the panelists uh, just quickly maybe share their thought leadership about the current technical hurdles we're having around Istio. So um, Mitch, maybe start with you first this time. Oh, that's good. That means that no one else can claim my answer. Uh, so I would say one of the biggest technical hurdles from my perspective is uh, API maturity stagnation. We've, we've set a very high bar for what a GA API is or a stable V1 API is. And matter of fact, we set it so high that I'm not sure we'll ever reach it as a project. Uh, so we've been reevaluating that over recent months. Uh, we don't want to be sending the signal to our users that, yeah, it's a beta product. It's six years out there. It's been adopted in thousands of companies across the world. It runs all of your financial transactions, et cetera. But it's in beta. We're not really sure about it. We're not confident about it. And we might, by the way, our beta role, our, deprecation policy is three months. So we might just change our mind and turn it all off and break it all. That's not what we want to be telling our users at all. Uh, so we are making a concerted effort to move APIs to V1 this year uh, to communicate to users that these are stable. They're ready for production. We are not going to yank the rug out from under your feet. Uh, and you can depend on them. So I think that's been a friction for users for a number of years. And I'm excited to have, I think it's, it's predominantly the Microsoft team driving uh, moving those forward to maturity, really appreciate their efforts. Yeah, I guess one I would add is, you know, obviously Ambient is kind of the, the new thing that is taking up a lot of the active development time, and there's all sorts of new challenges that have come up from that. We saw a great talk this morning about some of the challenges with running Ambient on kind of arbitrary clusters and all the different uh, creative things we had to do to make that work. Um, so that's a big area of development. A lot of the other uh, technical challenges in Istio have been kind of very long uh, multi-year processes that are kind of well known. And it's kind of this newer thing that we're still uh, kind of learning as we go. And of course, we're approaching beta now very soon. So uh, now we're kind of in the execution phase and we've kind of figured out where we want to go and what we need to solve there. So, Yeah, Louis, what's your thoughts? Um, there are lots uh, of them. Um, this too is a, a big project that has it covers a large surface. Um, you know, one, one of the things you can tell by what Mitch said and what John said is we obviously progress features to stability at different rates. Um, you know, that's actually one of the big motivating factors in Ambient is the fact that it provides for composition, not just at the API level, but also uh, at the infrastructural level. Um, so getting that to the place where people can start to leverage it is going to be pretty important. Uh, it was actually exciting for me to see somebody use Lua. Um, but they were using it inside Envoy Filter. 
if you were to pick one thing inside of Istio that we would like to work a lot better, it's the extensibility API. Uh, and so, you know, I think when Ambient settles down, we need to put more investment into some of that to really help users out because those use cases are critical uh, and we see them every day. Yeah, the only thing I want to add is I, I know in our 1.21 releases, we introduced the compatibility version, and John here did a lot of work around that. I think that's one of the biggest hurdles we had in Istio for the longest time in the past as a project being seven years. We kind of made uh, a lot of decisions. Uh, sometimes it may make sense, but after hearing from many of you, you know, we decided that that's not the right decision or that's not the right move, uh, so I think, uh, you know, upgrade has been, continues to be like the biggest hurdle we have in Istio. I'm really hoping the compatibility version we introduced in 1.21 really made that easier uh, for every single user out there. Um, with that, I'm sorry about the emoji, I don't know what happens. Uh, with that, I want to uh, see if anyone have any questions. Be our first uh, questions. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I thought I'd break the ice. Um, my company has recently started adopting Istio. We have two workloads on Istio now, um, as of about a month ago. Um, the thing that we are most interested in is multi-cluster. Um, and I'm on the SRE team, and the kind of challenge we're facing is to, um, via automation or GitOps, actually configure multiple clusters, because you kind of got to do the, um, the certificate sharing, and then you got to get a token from one cluster into the other, and vice versa. Any advice around that, or any upcoming features or plans that'll make that easier? I think, actually, if you were here for the previous talk from China Mobile, uh, you saw a very compelling way to automate the setup of a multi-cluster, onboard new clusters into a multi-cluster paradigm. Also, that pattern of having one central cluster that houses your control plane, that houses your config, and each of the other clusters effectively are acting just as data planes to that central cluster, I think has proved a pretty solid pattern across the industry. Uh, and I think you'd, you'd do well to reach out. I, I, don't, I didn't see where those folks went, but uh, you should get in touch. Yeah, per perhaps the other thing I would add is, right, C. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. I, just, I just want my t shirt. I'm just kidding. Right, CA <laughs> so. infrastructure and CA provisioning is, right, like, it's going to depend a lot on what vendor you've chosen, right, and so, you know, take a good look at that as well and the facilities that different CAs provide, uh, whether it's one of the other CNCF projects like Spire uh, or a commercial vendor, uh, you know, there's quite a lot of variability there, or you're using a CSP solution. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, um, this question about, uh, we've been using Istio for some time at eBay, and uh, one of the challenges that we run into with your, that we don't necessarily have the expertise for is uh, getting it into ARM platform. Is that something that you have thoughts on that you're heading towards? As uh, Istio, do you recommend going there? We've had some trouble building. Yeah, John, you want to talk about that ARM? Um, yeah, did you say you've tried it and had issues? or? Uh, yeah, I mean, in Istio, I added ARM support um, a few releases back. Um, it should just kind of work out of the box without any configuration, anything to do. You just, if you have ARM nodes, it will now work. Um, and there's been plenty of people uh, that, you know, are running on ARM on uh, various clouds. We've seen some cool demos on, like, Raspberry Pis and whatnot, uh, which have also been fun. So. The best way to... I one not fifteen maybe it was a yeah, while ago. It's uh, been a while. If you're on a version that's old enough to not have ARM support, uh, please upgrade for other reasons. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, that's good shout out. Istio.io slash security. Uh, the the best way though to get support for a new architecture is to buy the developers' laptops on that architecture. So. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. Uh, great question on the ARM. Uh, to summarize, migrate to your Istio to 1.15 if you need ARM support. Uh, the next question. Hi, my next question is probably for John. Um, we are heavily Google Cloud users, and uh, we, we love it so far with everything. But then when we try to enable manage Istio and then set up some tracing and other stuff, it feels like once you try to use it, based on the Istio documentation here and there, it comes limited edition provided by Google. Is there any plan to extend and have an even better integration of how, or maybe it was me just not using it right? Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, we can chat afterwards. I think we probably, you know, should discuss vendor roadmaps on this panel. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take that question to private. If you want a T-shirt, do you want one? Okay, I'll try it again. Better? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, please ask your question. Thank you. Thanks. So assuming Ambient goes well and you've got loads of time to work on other features, can you talk more about how you would like to extend the extensibility um, API? Like, what, what are the features you would like to get out soon? So, you know, th there's obviously the capabilities of the data plane to be extended, right? There's kind of two basic extension mechanisms, right? Either the data plane calls out to some system using a standard interface, like x.z, right, in, in Envoy. Um, I think there's probably a push now to maybe use xproc a bit more than x.z. Uh, because XProf is a bit more general purpose, right? You can do things like content transformation in it. Um, so there's the callout pattern, and then there's also, you know, running some embedded code, whether it's WASM or Lua, which are the two kind of embedded runtime options. Uh, and so really it's about enabling those use cases and giving a, an API that explains the context in which that code is going to be run well. Um, so there's already a, a WASM API that's still alpha, right? It needs to be progressed. Uh, it's probably missing a couple of features, but it's a reasonable kind of outline of what you could expect for APIs in that area in terms of, I want this piece of code to run when this happens, right? In, over here, or like wherever you want it to run. So that will be the focus of the API. Uh, and also making sure that that API works well with the gateway API pattern and the gamma patterns that we're adopting as part of amb ambient, right? So that, it has some particular API design patterns and idioms, and I actually suggest people should go to some of the gateway API talks here at KubeCon uh, to get an idea of what that API surface looks like and how these extensions fit within that. Uh, so that will be the focus, I think, in the project. All right, thank you. I think extensibility also goes hand in hand with ecosystem integrations. Um, we decided a long time ago that Istio wasn't going to do everything that the network could possibly do. Uh, there are plenty of other tools out there that are great at being API gateways or other things. And so part of the ambient pattern is going to be making it easier to integrate those other things into your service mesh so that you don't need to find ways to translate, say, your Nginx behavior. If you have a really long Nginx config that's lived for 15 years, no one wants to touch it because you don't know what's going to break. You don't need to translate that all to Istio config. You should be able to say, hey, for this service, we're going to spin up an Nginx gateway, and Istio is going to send traffic to it, and we'll know that we have continuity there because of that. So extensibility and integration go very much hand in hand in, in Istio. Thank you. Thanks for that great question. Uh, the next guy, uh, please ask. Hello. Uh, my question is regarding the rate limits in Istio and whether you are recommending to use Envoy rate, rate limit service to uh, for this purpose, as in our company still we have the workloads on our on-prem clusters, which uh, and we are just implementing Istio on on-prem and in the GCP side. Uh, so, in the GCP side, the cloud armor is quite well and it's solving our problems. But on the on-prem side, we wanted to. Uh, implement Istio and we are trying to figure it out whether whether the using the Envoy rate limit service is a good way to go with this on production and whether we can use it for example in the pattern like uh, rate limit per for example team or workloads. Yes? So it's my question. <laughs> uh, so it's uh, Obviously, the rate limiting support right in Istio itself is fairly thin. Like Envoy has, you know, its built-in rate limiting feature, right, which is a local rate limiting only feature, right, which any one Envoy enforces a rate limit. Very often, that's not what people want, right? They want a unified rate limit for their service across many instances. Then you're into the world of choosing, right, one of n different solutions. Istio is not in the business of recommending, right. Uh, any one of those solutions, right? Obviously, it's an ecosystem. Um, I, you know, I've, I've seen a variety of them used. Vendors obviously provide their own that are tested. Um, if you're working with a vendor, you should obviously be talking to them about 
what their solution is and evaluating whether you feel like it meets your needs or not, right? There are limits to what Istio is going to take on, right? And so that is one of the limits, I think, in terms of like the project boundary between what we think we should be providing, which is an integration point, and what the ecosystem should be providing or the vendor ecosystem or people develop in-house. Uh, we've seen, certainly seen a lot of companies who have their own rate limiting systems that they've built, uh, and then they integrate with them via the standard integration APIs. Um, so I actually don't have a specific recommendation, and I actually don't think these guys do either, because I just asked them. Uh, I mean, Zach might. <laughs> Sorry, I actually do. So the rate limiting service is a good way to start. So let me just, uh, it is widely used in production. Lyft uses it in production. They built it and contributed into the Envoy uh, upstream. So that is, a, that is a great place to start, right? So I'll just put that, because that's the one specific question, whether or not it has parity with other things, that, but good place to start. That's backed by Redis, right? Correct, and that's good. Yeah, that, that one's based on Redis, and yeah, Zach's right, that one's been around for quite a while and is pretty widely used. Yeah, definitely, I would echo that. We've actually seen a lot of users uh, using the rate limiting service. The only challenge, uh, I agree, with Istio is the Envoy filter representing rate limiting is a little bit harder to use. Um, so that would, uh, might be good to check out a vendor for that. Uh, okay, uh, we have um, about 10 t-shirts, so if you like the question, if you like the t-shirt, when you ask the question, stay at the end, so I know you want a t-shirt. If you don't uh, want the t-shirt after you ask the question, you can go back to your seats. Uh, some way, just let me know if you, you want the t-shirt or not. So I think you still want it, right? All right, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, so we are running Istio in like a heavily multi-tenant environment where uh, we deploy a lot of workloads, the workload scale, uh, they receive uh, like the wall mesh configuration. Now the, the right uh, direction would be using the sidecar API so we can like model how, um, what is concerning or what is not concerning for the workload. However, for some reasons, where it's not possible, um, is there anything in the roadmap that can add, like, push only the configuration that is needed using the metrics that is still publishes? Is it something that you think it's a concern for Istio, or it's something that you think it should be solely responsibility for the users? Um, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a it's a good question. Um, you know, we've considered whether we should automate things or have tooling to help do it. Um, I think at one point, I think Mitch and I accidentally, independently, both wrote a tool, and then both neither of us finished it uh, to look at metrics and kind of give you suggestions. I think Kiali even has an integration that does this, but it's tricky to integrate into the core of the project because so many different metrics providers out there. There's not really one integration point. Um, one of the other things is that with Ambient the configuration size and scaling problem is kind of radically different. Um, so last KubeCon in Chicago, I think, uh, I gave a talk on that if you want to learn more. Um, so today, yeah, the, the choices are really semi-automatic or kind of, or sorry, semi-manual or some, yeah, whatever. Um, but there's no fully automated um, solution for that. Uh, there's no current plans. I wouldn't say that's, you know, the forever answer. That sounds like an excellent opportunity for a new CNCF sandbox project right there. So uh, we'll look for your, your, your merge. Yeah, I think there are some, uh, not core projects, but, you know, um, isolated projects that are doing things in this nature. I'm not sure of all the names or, you know, the d details of them. All right. I hope that answers your question. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Um, our product is using uh, ASM to Google Cloud on-premise service, so very heavily. Uh, I want to know, so I know that ambient, uh, ambient is getting more and more stable recently since it could work upon any kind of CNI plugins. So I want to know when will it be released on ASM so I think because the current price is so crazy uh, for our product team, so uh, I know uh, John is working at Google, so could you please provide some inside information or some commercial plan 2024? Uh, 
Uh, I cannot provide that information, <laughs> I think. Oh. But uh, like Lynn said, in open source, Ambient uh, will be going into beta in 1.22, um, which is very exciting. Uh, but I, I can't give Google roadmaps. OK, thank you. Sorry. For, for what it's worth, we all worked on ASM as engineers in the past or present. That is true, uh, all three of us. <laughs> you, should be, you should be talking to your product manager yeah, about we, that. They're the ones who really have the lever to say. We are using it on our canary environment. But in the production environment, I, I, so it's, yeah. it's not it's impossible for now. All right. Uh, this is just a reminder for everybody. If you ask a product-related question, this may not be your best place. This is a community conference, so we would love you to ask questions regarding Istio uh, first. Uh, so thank you. Uh, go ahead, please. Hello. Um, we have been using Istio for, for a while. Uh, one thing which I noticed is when we have a high traffic, uh, the load balancing is not so good. Uh, and we have some things configured at Envoy, so this is more related to Envoy. But uh, is there any uh, thing which can be done to um, have more TCP connections balanced across uh, in um, the downstream and the upstream parts? Um, any such you know, things which are being developed more further in that area? When you say that the load balancing is not ideal, you're getting too much traffic on particular nodes, not balancing to others. And is this HTTP or TCP traffic? Yeah, HTTP and most, uh, it's like I'm talking about in Envoy, we have like about uh, worker threads, like 36 dependent number of cores. What we have seen is like uh, the traffic coming on one TCP connection and it goes to about 240 workloads. So all of them goes to one worker thread, which is running 97% or 100% CPU and the traffic is imbalanced across the ingress gateway ports. So, uh, I mean, we have been trying all this on-way configuration, exact balance and all, but it's not helping the way we want to envision that inbound and outbound. So it handles on the same worker thread. Is uh, Envoy or Istio has anything more insight in that which we can balance out the TCP inbound and outbound, like upstream and downstream? Um. There's a lot of knobs. Uh, it's, it's hard to say without knowing more details which ones would help. Um, you know, a GitHub discussion thread or a Slack thread would probably be productive here. Right. Um, you know, there's the exact balance thing I think you mentioned. There's also all sorts of knobs and destination rule around like number of requests per connection, mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of things. There's a pretty long list of things, load balancing algorithms, um, but it, it's a bit hard to be prescriptive without more info. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one, one thing I would make sure, uh, you know, it, depending on which version of Istio you're using, like make sure you're using elastic weighted. Sorry? Elastic weighted load balancing as the default, like least request style, yeah. uh, instead of round robin, uh, which was the default in Istio and actually oh, still okay. is the default. No, oh, and we switched it. It's switched, yeah. yeah. That's right. Um, obviously, the, the kind of siloed or like single threaded nature of Envoy association of one request, one core. Right. You can have specific situations in load balancing where that can lead to suboptimal load balancing. Mm -hmm. That's a very generic Envoy problem. Yeah. There's no roadmap to make Envoy free-threaded. Um, so you kind of compensate for that in other ways. But it, it, it certainly can lead to some load balancing issues um, that you know you can address somewhat with scale or a better back-end load balancing or better front-end load balancing or multi-tier load balancing to address some of those things. But there are just specific limitations the Envoy architecture. And that's how it gets some of its efficiency, which is a bit of a trade-off, right? You're getting yeah. more throughput uh, at a cost of some latency in some cases. Yeah, we, we had a limitation of uh, number of TCP connections. So I think we have to live with that. With some. Can I ask one question more? Um, so uh, going forward with IPv6, right, what is the uh, update with Istio, like we had 1.17, which was an experimental release for IPv6, and uh, does uh, is there a further uh, progress on that? Like, is it uh, alpha now uh, with IPv6 uh, Istio? Um, I'm not sure the official status, but it's fairly stable for pure IPv6. Um, what is a bit less stable and more in development is the dual stack support, uh, yeah. which is still experimental and kind of undergoing uh, a lot of development right now. So there's a lot of people working on that actively, so I think it will progress um, very well. But the pure IPv6 is, is fairly stable. Is your, yeah, is your interest on pure IPv6 or yeah, do Yeah, so stack? mostly I'm looking for um, inbound traffic uh, and out outbound traffic, which is uh, doing conversion. Or if not conversion, then the workload inside will have to do handle uh, dual stack. 
So if to, we want to avoid that, maybe if Istio can do that conversion from IPv6 to IPv4 using virtual service or something, uh, that would be the best, right? I mean, then Istio can handle the conversion of IPv6. Uh, the internal workloads did not handle IPv6 uh, in that case. Yeah, so that would be the single stack case with an ingress or regress gateway operating in, in dual stack mode. Yeah. Is that the use case you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, ingress and egress would be on dual stack and do the conversion and internal workload just on IPv4. If that is something feasible, that would be the best thing out of it still. Is that something planned or? Uh, I, I would, if I'm understanding the use case right, I think the dual stack support that's being worked on would cover that use case. Yeah. Uh, but like I said, that's still kind of under active development. So you could try it out, uh, but it's not necessarily production ready yet for the dual stack. Yeah, this is also an area I think we would love some contribution. I believe it's experimental right now in dual stack, so we would definitely love some contribution on this. So just to sum up, I, we would recommend you to open an issue for your first issue about load balancing and try with uh, some of the newer Istio build, and uh, you know we can come back to you to see if it's an Istio or Envoy issue, and hopefully we'll see you in the community for dual stack contribution. Sure, thank and you. thanks so much for thank your you, questions. Thank you. All uh, right. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, I have no questions, but I would like to just thank you all the contributors and maintainers and developers of the Istio because it's making my life a lot easier because I don't have to bundle CA certificates in the container images and ship it and then less hassle to upgrade the uh, CA certificates when it expires and I learned a, a lot about Istio when I was preparing for the certificate and I got it thankfully so thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to you um, and I assume you want a t-shirt too. Thank you so much for that comments. Uh, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, I ask this question uh, private or on the working group meeting, but I want to share it. Uh, uh, so the L4 for MBNT is beta now, so what's the plan for L7? And uh, the other question is, uh, last time I tried the MBNT, uh, I felt it was hard to upgrade the internal without uh, any downtime. So is it fixed, fixed or what's the plan for it? So, yeah. um, so certainly the plan for Ambient L7 is to stabilize it as quickly as possible. If we could get some of that done for 122, I think we would. Um, so certainly not making any commitments, but it's, I, I would certainly prefer to see that happen. Uh, at the very least, we would stabilize the contract between L4 and L7 in, in terms of the relationship between Z-Tunnel and the Waypoint, even if Istio's Waypoint implementation itself was not, say, what we would consider beta quality. Um, though I think that should actually be fairly achievable, uh, but we'll have to see. Um, you want to take the other part, John? Uh, yeah, on the upgrade side, we've done you know some work on this, but for now, a lot of the focus on getting to beta has been not around upgrades and migrations because uh, you know for the newer, or less stable, we're kind of targeting greenfield. Uh, right after we do that, focus on onboarding um, existing users of sidecars, doing upgrades between versions. I think that will be a priority. Uh, Bival and Ben, who are both here, or at least were this morning, are experts on this and have spent a lot of time. Um, so if you want to know a lot more about upgrades, uh, I'm sure they'd love to talk about some strategies that they've prototyped. Yeah, certainly the Z-Tunnel upgrade, since the, we made that big change to how Z-Tunnel was integrated, like it's much more seamless than it was before. So depending on when you tried it versus what's in 121, right, there's a big difference. Um, so take a look at what Ben and Yuval's demo, I don't know if you were able to make it this morning, but like, they, they showed a pretty compelling experience. All right, thank you so much for that great question. Um, we have five more minutes, uh, so I would like t 10 minutes. All right, awesome. So we might be able to get all the questions. Uh, yeah, hello guys, thank you for your work. Uh, we use not the newest version of Vista, we use 1.16. And uh, recently, we started monitoring the um, convergence time, like when all the configuration reaches the destination invoice. We use uh, multi-primary setup. We have a lot of services. Um, and we saw that the 19th percentile 
of convergence time was about five seconds. We started researching how can we lower it because it's critical for us. Uh, we found the issues, so we found the recommendations to disable caches. We disabled CDS, RDS cache. Uh, like this timing became smaller, for example, three seconds. We tried to um, change uh, debounce timing. We tried to increase replicas of ESTOD. Uh, we decreased this timing to two seconds. But uh, we are not sure that uh, in the future, when we scale, it will be the same. And my question is about your roadmap. How do you see it? Like, do you have any plans to? And I'll decrease this convergence time. Maybe you have any thoughts about using Envoy Delta API to push not the full context, but the Delta. Uh, sure. Yeah, there's um, a, a lot of stuff here. So I think um, in terms of what you can do even today as a user, there's like the configuration scoping that someone else mentioned that can reduce the work that Easter needs to do quite a bit. That's really the most effective uh, and can be done in any Istio version. Uh, we just launched a doc on Easter.io that describes all the different ways, because there's a few different options when you should use which one. Uh, it may be helpful there. Um, some other things, you said 1.16, I think. Since then, there's been a lot of uh, optimizations in this area as well, so simply upgrading might be pretty meaningful. Um, it's hard to know if the issues you're seeing are like you're hitting some edge case that happens to be slow. We fixed many of those. Or if it's just you're sending a lot of work, like. Easter just has to do a bunch of work. There's not um, many ways around that just by upgrading, right? Um, in the next release, uh, 1.22, we're aiming to enable Delta XDS on by default. Um, so that will be there. I will caveat that it is not a perfect Delta implementation. So we do implement the protocol and do some incremental updates. But there's some cases where we still send a bunch of redundant configuration. But once we get our foot in the door and have kind of the initial release, it's kind of easy uh, optimization moving forward. Probably each release, I'm sure, will optimize it more and more. Um, there's also some other things um, on the roadmap around some, uh, some of the just proto buff. That's where a lot of CPU time is spent in East2D. We have some ideas on how we can cut that basically in half, uh, which would be a nice improvement as well. Um, I mentioned earlier as well in Ambient, the configuration scale problem is totally different. Um, so it's almost in many ways, like a, I don't want to say it's a solved problem, but it's, um, it's probably an issue that becomes uh, not relevant unless you're at a ginormous scale. Um, so there's all sorts of things. If, if you upgrade and you know, try these out and you're still seeing issues, there's also um, a, a page on Eastview about analyzing performance. You can get a profile uh, posted on GitHub. I always love to see where people are bottlenecked. And if it's you know, some edge case or something, then it's usually uh, pretty easy to figure out from that and, and you know, make some optimizations. So. OK, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Well, thank you for the great question. And uh, you know, I appreciate all the different things you tried. You're really working hard on it still. Thank you. All right, uh, we might be able to take two more questions. <laughs> Go ahead. OK, uh, hi. Uh, thanks uh, for presentations for your work. Uh, so our situation is that, like every half year, I try to evaluate if I can use Istio in our deployment. And every half year, I decide that not. The reason <clears throat> is that, uh, OK, while I, as a, an engineer, I can probably introduce Istio for a couple of services, but most of our, our deployments are made by usual developers. And for me, sometimes it's even hard to persuade people to use home charts. I mean, yes, seriously, I'm serious now. <laughs> uh, is there any plans, you know, for Istio maybe to uh, at least uh, support some default configurations like plug and play, like some of your competitors at least try to do? So that like, basically I just create uh, labels on namespace, and I say that I, I want everything at least mutual TLS in the namespace. I don't care a lot about proper load balancing maybe, at least like as a first very simple step. Are there any plans for that, maybe? So there, there's not, and that I'll tell you that's a good thing. Your question is a perfect advertisement for the practice of platform engineering. Uh, so products like Argo, Backstage, uh, um, Crossplane, uh, these are all going to help you create sane defaults that are best for you. 
we could never choose the defaults that are going to be best for your environment or your developers. Everyone is going to have a unique set of constraints. And so the pattern that we've seen succeed the most at companies is where a few engineers have a deep understanding of Kubernetes and Istio and networking, et cetera. They build a platform that provides all those same defaults so that developers have very few choices as they go to deploy that application and things just work under the hood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Well, I want to add to Mitch's point, right? If you look at the demo you did, right, for Ambient, the only thing you need to do is label your namespace, you got mutual TLS automatically, and then layer seven function is more about leveraging what um, Mitch said, using IDP or Argo to make it easy, because you have to let us know what function you need. Okay, uh, then another first question. What if uh, a node process, which is that tunnel, if I'm not mistaken, code, yes, fails. Will I lose all connectivity from this node until it restarts? Are there any plans to have two processes, one is primary, another is secondary, just to reduce, you know, like, like downtime? Yes, I understand that I should do pot anti-affinity and so on, but. <laughs> uh, is that in co context of Z-Tunnel uh, for the upgrade? Or just? Downtime, like yes, for downtime. Oh, okay. If we like, um, note the diamonds, I mean, if we uh, go to basically one process which handles all communications on a node, not sidecars, yes, then it's like single point of failure, basically. Yes, uh, the we have not seen a reason to do that yet. Okay. Right? So it will depend on what we start to see in production. Um, it's certainly designed to be capable of that, mm -hmm. but unless we see a reason to deliver that, like it would just be complexity for no value. Uh, Obviously, we're very focused on making Z-Tunnel incredibly stable, right? Like mm -hmm. as stable as, say, a kernel module or a, something of those lines, right? Which are also logically single points of failure, right? Yeah. Running on a node. Um, so until we see meaningful examples of that in production, it would just represent complexity. So I think the more pressing case is upgrade, actually, mm -hmm. where you want to go from Z-Tunnel 1 to 1.1, uh, and how little downtime we can give you, you during that upgrade process. Uh, right now, because Z-Tunnel starts so incredibly quickly, right, we're fine just firing a new one up and then cutting traffic over. Um, but we may look at providing better options there. But again, based on what we see act actual user experience. No, but upgraded is, is, is usually a planned procedure, so it's usually not a, not a problem, actually. I mean, usually people, when do upgrade, they know that they will be on time, probably. That's okay. But if it's stable, then thank you. Well, thank you for your great questions. You want one? Okay, yeah. All right. Uh, looks like we will extend it to a few more minutes. Go ahead. Uh, hello. First of all, thank you for your work and for this panel. Uh, I would want to ask about uh, FIPS compliance. Uh, is there any plans to support this in upstream project? I know there are some alternatives like uh, third party offerings or building from the source, but maybe it is in roadmap to deliver this uh, as part of upstream project. Thank you. Uh, okay. So there's Compliance, and then there's certification, right? And it's, it would be very hard for an open source project to say that it's FIPS certified, and I'm sure Zach's gonna wanna come up and maybe talk about this. Um, obviously, we do a lot in Istio to make sure that we use best practice, both technologies and libraries and tools in terms of dependencies. Uh, we're, not, we're not a legal entity in the certification sense, right? So we can't provide you a kind of fiscal-like guarantee that we're, Istio is FIPS certified, right? And That's specifically, you have to pay for that certification on yeah. major releases. And so on the open source side, we actually have the FIPS built. You can yes. build it in FIPS mode yourself. Okay. But you have to pay somebody for that certification, and that's a cost that the open source project can't bear, right? Because who, who would, it, it's pretty pricey. Yeah. Uh, now, now you can work, right, usually FIPS is part of a larger certification program like FedRAMP or something else that a compliance, you have to go through a compliance program, right, as some solution provider. You can often use Istio as part of that certification process for what you're building and, like, have your certification auditor look at it and go, yes, you're using technology that's following best practice and therefore meet your needs in terms of compliance. Um, but we can't say we're, like, rubber stamp FIPS certified. We we adhere to all the best practices that should allow you to go through that process much more easily. Um, if you want that rubber stamp, you have to go to a vendor, right? Like that's not something I think you would see from any CNCF project. 
right? Then there's the other technical world, which is what, what should people actually be doing, right? In terms of algorithmic security, NIST recommendations, the difference between the different regulatory bodies like FedRAMP versus the EU, that's a very complicated and involved long list of discussions, which I don't want to bore people to tears about. But if you want to talk about it afterwards, there's plenty of people who would happily talk to you about it. Um, but there's also some interesting kind of uh, concerns in that space as well. All right, thank you yep. for that great question. Summarize, probably go to a vendor if you need a uh, FIPS certified. And you are the lucky person. This is the last shirt. Probably won't fit for you, so go to the solo booth for exchange. Thank you. Uh, first, ahead. thank you. Um, I started doing Kubernetes and stuff uh, while deploying Istio uh, a few years back. So I kind of got me where I'm here. So thank you guys for that. And in the four years I've been doing Istio, uh, I feel like I've barely scratched the surface of all features and use cases there is. And just a question, do you have like use case of features you feel are underrated or just very proud of technically? And like as maintainers, what are parts of Istio you just are really excited about and might not be as visible to others? The, the standard onboarding story is I came to Istio for security. I realized I had no idea what auth policies I should be writing because I don't know which services I own and how they connect to. And so telemetry helped me to understand what I own so that I'm capable of securing Istio. For, so for me, telemetry is sort of the, uh, the undervalued player there. <laughs> this is not really answering the question, but my favorite is when uh, you know someone goes and adopts Istio, and instead of trying to use every single feature all at once before they understand it, they say, "Ah, that looks nice, but I don't need that today, and I'm gonna you know reduce my complexity." The people that come and say, "Oh, Istio is too complex," they're like, "I'm gonna go through every task, and I must have one of each <laughs> in my cluster. It's like the checkbox." Uh, which doesn't really go well for, especially for new users onboarding. You know, after years of experience, sure, maybe if you have all those use cases, it makes sense. Um, so I'm always happy when someone says, that looks nice, but it's not for me yet. Um, all right, thank you so much for that great question. Yeah, we were able to get you our last question. Thank you, go ahead. Thank you. Well, one of the things that I love about Istio is that we run since 1.13, and the process of upgrading has been really smooth. I mean, we use releases and tags and so on. We are at the last version. It was super easy for us to upgrade. So thank you for that. It was a very nice. I tried it out like 0 0.8 or something like that. It was a upgrading hell. But now it's pretty cool. Wow, I needed to have you recorded. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, my question is, um, we have been running Istio for the uh, two years or so. And we want to increase adoption of our workloads uh, in, in our company. We are about 50, 55 percent. If we want to get what, to 100, of course. But uh, one of the features that we are having trouble is that uh, we use uh, API gateway on our uh, border, and a lot of APIs like to have uh, fallbacks for, for example, S3 static content in, if, if they have some sort of trouble. We are struggling with that because we, we had to try it out a lot of uh, Envoy future and go really deep into Envoy, you know, with the configuration and modules and so on. Uh, you guys see something related to that to make it easier, for example, for me to fall back, not straight to S3 if I want, but at least for another workload inside my, my, my cluster that can proxy to S3 or something like that, because I know that there are, there are DNS problems with that, and depending on the uh, URL that they are using, I don't know if this is something that came up in the, in the, um, um, the, the, the research that you did, the, for, the, the forms and so on. So Envoy has a, a bulk heading feature. Uh, well, Envoy has a lot of features <laughs> that people could use to solve this problem in a few different ways. Um, you're probably the third person who's asked a bulk heading question that I can remember in the last year. So I think the first problem we have is we need some more consistent user feedback about what people actually want here. Because it's, right, there's a very wide range of solutions here from like built in bulk heading features to serve static content to integrating with like a higher availability cache like S3 or say memcache or something like that. 
um, to tiered fallback and load balancing mechanisms during retry, right? Where Envoy has this feature called composite cluster and you can say, well, pick from this cluster first, but if you retry, pick from that one, right? Those obviously add very different like requirements in the API and the configuration mechanism and we're not really sure which one to give people. So we actually need some more user feedback in aggregate to actually decide if that complexity is worth carrying. Um, and then the kind of compensation for that is, okay, if we're not going to build it in, then can you use one of the extensibility mechanisms to do it yourself, which is really what we would like, um, and we make that too hard. So the one thing that we know we have to solve is Envoy filter. Um, and so I think our focus should probably be on that in the short term until we get more consistent feedback about what people might want from bulkheading um, or look at some of the other extensibility mechanisms that we've talked about. I think we're going to wrap up. Do you want to say something quick, John? Yeah, I, I will say if in core Istio, if there's workloads within the same service, you can configure a failover between those. Um, but to do like cross service or cross namespace or to an external thing, that's what's missing. Um, but you could, like you mentioned, having a proxy to yeah. S3, yeah, you could probably kind of make it work. Yeah. I don't All know, right. It's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks for the great question. And I want to thank all the panelists for answering all these tough questions. Thank you for being here.